This is Seismic Hazard Basic Chapter B2. I'm Keith Kelson. It's January 31st, 2021. The outline of this presentation includes an introduction on the types of seismic hazards and how seismic hazard information is used in risk assessment and the basics of seismic source models and ground motion models, and then a summary of the primary steps and products in um, deterministic seismic hazard analysis, and the same for probabilistic seismic hazard analyses, just the steps and products. That's the overall outline and key concepts. As you know from this workshop, the components of seismic risk are hazard and performance, and then resulting consequences, should that go bad, and we plot that on a risk FN chart or other metrics. That Those are the components of seismic risk. The um, What we're going to focus on here are the hazard components primarily, just seismic hazard, and then performance and consequences come later. The primary seismic hazards are five. There are five primary ones. The first four are all related to strong ground motions, generally long duration strong ground motions. Strong ground shaking includes, you know, the hazards are the differential movement between components of the facility, whether it's embankment or parts of a, a, a dam or levee. Um, liquefaction, which includes a permanent displacement or loss of strength temporarily that could cause damage, like we saw in um, Fukushima 2011. Landsliding, reservoir siege are also sometimes important. And then lastly, the oddball in uh, most dams in the U.S. is permanent ground deformation related to either fault rupture or faulting or tilting. So um, we'll focus primarily on ground shaking. But what, I, what this next slide shows is the, the potential failure modes that are related to each of those earthen, uh, to either earthen dams or concrete dams uh, as related to strong ground shaking as shown here in red. These are just some common PFMs. They're not actual, um, always true, and there are others in addition. But you can see that strong ground shaking can produce potential failure modes for both earthen dams for levees, as well as concrete dams. Liquefaction, pretty much just earthen components. And of course, landsliding and siege both have um, components to both of those should happen, and permanent ground information as all. But we're gonna focus primarily on these ones right here, the strong ground shaking, and these are the potential failure modes that you'll wanna be aware of for the ground shaking, the cracking, the spillway walls and the other three red ones that are shown down in here. So how do we use that in uh, a potential failure mode and ultimately risk assessment? So there are um, generally event trees often contain two external loading components, the hydrologic and the seismic. Okay, and the seismic input that I'm going to discuss today go here. Now implicitly in these event trees because of the, the um, merging of these two nodes, the the uh, the event trees implicitly treat the joint pr conditional probability of those two reservoir or those two loading things, which are reservoir pool elevations and then levels of ground motions over a given annual exceedance probabilities. And then the subsequent system response, such as from here and to the right, is captured by these event nodes to the right. And the seismic loading input is generally put in right here, and it's generally in the form of a seismic hazard component. Okay, uh, I mean a seismic hazard curve with a annual exceedance probability or AEP on the y-axis and acceleration, some metric on ground motions, whether it's peak ground acceleration or some other spectral acceleration on the x-axis. And on a semi-log plot with log AEP and linear accelerations, the curve will look something like this, more or less. Okay. The performance input comes later. It's if there's a flaw and those hazard and flood loading components are significant, then you would consider the flaw and the seismic input performance. And sometimes to calculate that or estimate that, you'll need more detailed seismic performance analysis. So we we have some 
basics that we'll talk about today that involve this and that will give you the foundation for making um, not making decisions whether these more detailed analyses are necessary. And then you go on through the event tree. So let me talk about the basic components of seismic hazards, and those include seismic source models and ground motion models. Okay, so seismic source models, there are two types. There's fault specific and there's aerial. So let's talk about the faults first. And one of the most famous ones in the US is now the Cascadia subduction zone, which has not produced an earthquake in the last 200 years of significance. But we know that the return period uh, is about that time period and we should be aware. The Cascadia subduction zone works like this. There's a, a plate that's being subducted underneath North America and that plate sticks and slips as it gets um, subducted underneath it's because there's compression between the um, basically the Pacific Ocean out here and the North American craton here. And when it sticks and slips, there's an earthquake that occurs on that um, that interface zone. That's the slipping. And then it sticks for a while and strain is accumulated and then it's released in the form of an earthquake. And those earthquakes are generally large, right? Because the, the distances, the lengths of the subduction zone is great. The widths are great and the magnitudes are in the eights and nines. Uh, again, the return period is on the order of a couple hundred years. Other earthquakes can occur in the Cascadia subduction zone though, like the intraslab earthquakes. And these are ones that occur within the Juan de Fuca plate that's going underneath North America. As that slab gets subduction, subducted, it gets cracked up and earthquake can occur. They generally are in the five to seven and a half range-ish. The third source in this area are faults, specific faults, crustal things that we can walk around on the in the field on. And um, based on length and width parameters, we can estimate that the magnitude from those are in the five to seven range and on paleo seismologic inf information from past earthquakes. So the crustal sources are generally closer to uh, our dams, but not always but the frequency content of the crustal sources is different than those from either of the others. And so the hazard depends on what your facility is, uh, whether it's responsive to low frequency ground motions or high frequency ground motions, and then it's distance from either the crustal sources or the lock sources. Okay, so let's zero in a little bit more on the crustal sources and how we would characterize that. Um, let's take these six dams shown here by the red dots. This is a crustal um, source, seismic source characteristic characterization for these. And you can see the faults shown in orange lines or the, the areas over which those faults occur. Those fault zones are shown in these orange bands. For each of these, we, we estimate the probability of activity and then various geometric parameters and some sort of metric on what they're time of return period of generating large earthquakes. We can use slip rate or we can use actual return periods of known paleoseismic events. These are all captured in a logic tree mode. And a logic tree is just a way to do the bookkeeping for all of the different possibilities of fault geometry and, and things like that. So the source characteristics. So the length, the width, the down dip geometry, basically all of those features that control the magnitude that that fault can generate. So we use the term recurring large magnitude earthquakes or RLME to depict the, um, the magnitude of the earthquake that we are really of concern. So these range in the six and a half to seven and a half range for common, for Mears fault, we get up as big as seven and a quarter or 7.4. This is the one in central Oklahoma of relevance to dams down in that area. Um, so from a deterministic standpoint, this is what we want. We want the distribution of magnitudes from all those different geometries, and then we pull out one of those magnitudes and use that to calculate the ground motions. But in a probabilistic sense, we need to take into account the time component of that. That's what the rest of this logic tree represents, is the, the temporal characteristics of that range, of the production of those ranges in magnitudes for earthquakes. So sometimes the larger earthquakes are less frequent. Um, sometimes we have evidence of moderate magnitude earthquakes that are more common. 
Either way, we, we estimate what that temporal return period for each of the different magnitude nodes in this logic tree, and we come up with basically a distribution of probabilities of different earthquakes. And so the, there's two things. That logic tree provides the frequency of occurrence of different uh, magnitude earthquakes for each of the different seismic sources, and then we, um, we calculate the total um, hazard from each of those, as I'll explain later. And then the second benefit is the logic trees allow us to capture the uncertainty in all of our knowledge of those individual sources. And we call that epistemic uncertainty, or in, in uh, another term is just knowledge uncertainty. That's for fault sources. We do a similar type of logic tree for aerial sources, but I'm not going to go through that detail. I'll just give you an example of of one of those right here. The aerial sources just represents the areas over which we know it produces earthquakes, but we don't know what this fault specifically are that are responsible for those earthquakes. So the way that that is handled is the area of micro seismicity, historical micro or meso seismicity is delineated, delineated based on seismicity, like in New Madrid, and the seismotectonic zone. In other words, what we would expect has similar geology or similar, similar geologic history, that we can group these areas into zones that are likely to have a homogeneous rate of earthquake production. So what we do is we, we use the historical seismic catalog. We make sure it's all clean. And then based on the number of earthquakes within that time period of various magnitudes, we can draw a straight line in log-log space, actually semi-log space, that shows the rate of earthquake production for different magnitude earthquakes. And we project that to the large magnitude earthquakes that we're concerned about in, in seismic hazard analyses. Now, in the, both in the Western US and the Central and Eastern US, there's a maximum magnitude cutoff. In other words, we don't just extend this all the way to magnitude 10, um, because in the Western US, the maximum magnitude cutoff falls off in the six to six and a half range, because when there are earthquakes of that size or larger, we, we can usually find evidence of that through geology and geomorphology, and we attribute that into the fault specific seismic source characterization. In other parts of the world, sometimes it's not that easy or we don't have that good uh, information. And so the maximum magnitude cutoff falls in the seven or eight range. So the maximum magnitude cutoff for like this area might be um, seven or eight. But in New Madrid, because we have evidence of um, what the fault responsible for those earthquakes are, um, we can have the magnitude cutoff being slightly smaller. So anyway, that information goes into the ground motion analyses and now let's talk about those ground motion components we talked about the um just talked about the source effects source effects there are three components source effects path effects and then side effects to get your ground motions to be large um, uh, or to calculate in any given area so the sort of source effects i just talked about magnitude type of slip re recurrence those are all captured in those um, fault specific and aerial source characterization logic trees. Um, so there's an earthquake and then we look at the magnitude and how that earthquake was generated and then its recurrence. For path effects, these affect, uh, these are influenced by the path geology and the propagation direction and then the distance. And basically it re represents the characteristics of the materials that the energy that's released during an earthquake travels on its way from the hypocenter to the site of interest. So these are controlled by the seismic wave characteristics of the geology, basically the high velocity hard rocks or medium velocity soft rocks or the thickness of the brittle crustal material um, in that path. The direction of wave propagation can really matter if the geology is variable. So if the energy is traveling along the, um, the grain of the geology, then that sometimes acts as a waveguide and can increase or amplify ground motions. Or if it's going across the grain, then sometimes that will de-amplify the ground motions. So the, the direction of wave propagation will matter. So that's why you want to know which sources are going to generate that ground motions because the direction will, will be different. 
whether it's a long grain or a cross grain. And then the distance, of course, the greater the distance, the greater the attenuation of seismic energy, and then the lower the ground motions at the site of interest, okay? So that's the key, those are the key things in the path effects. And then your site, your site matters because the characteristics affect the way that the site materials respond to that strong ground shaking. So they depend in a large part on the nature of the shallow materials right beneath the site, like whether there's hard rock, like unfractured granite, or again, sandstone or unconsolidated alluvium, which is usually what our levees rest on. So the site class is, um, is generally used in ground motion prediction equations to estimate what those ground motions are from that site. And these site classes are accepted. This is an ASCII table, basically. Site classes are dependent on, are used, the classification is based on the seismic velocity or ge geophysical characteristics of the material that's in the upper 100 feet beneath your site. And, um, and so we can classify the site and then calculate the ground motions based on those site conditions. There are a couple other things that affect ground motions. They can either amplify it or de-amplify it. And those are basin effects or ridge top effects. So basin effects like in Seattle or Los Angeles, if it um, is a big bowl of jello, the ground motions could amplify or in fact de-amplify depending on what frequency you're interested in. And the same with ridge top effects. If you're at the top of a ridge, then um, certain frequencies can be amplified or de-amplified. So just keep that in mind. So how do we use that? We, we use it by what we call ground motion prediction equations. So these GMPEs basically represent the empirical relationships between some sort of ground motion parameter. In this case, peak ground acceleration or PGA. And that's a certain spectral frequency. And the distance um, from the hypocenter to your site, and that's based on the historical worldwide, worldwide database. You know, it's the empirical data set. So they show the attenuation of ground motion of ground motions with distance from your site. So this is the acceleration getting larger on the y-axis, and then the distance getting farther and farther away from the hypocenter. And you can see that there's considerable scatter, but the overall mean decreases with distance. That's what we would expect. And uh, sometimes we capture the uncertainty in that by looking at the standard deviations away from that mean. Um, if you're looking at one standard deviation above it, it's what we call a, an epsilon or epsilon of one is one standard deviation. An epsilon of two would be two standard deviations above the mean. So we consider both the distance and then the epsilon value in our calculations of ground motions. And these, of course, differ according to different magnitudes. They also differ according to different fault types. So that's why we want to understand the seismic source characteristics. So given the seismic source model and then these appropriate ground motion models, or GMPE, we can calculate the expected values of ground motions at any given site, as well as the uncertainty as depicted by the epsilon value. So how do we use that? Just one last basic component part. As you know, that the earthquake energy that is released contains many different um, spectral frequencies. It's not just the PGA value. The PGA is just one of those values. It's uh, 0.1 second. It's not the actual greatest acceleration value that a site can experience for a given earthquake because at different spectral frequencies, you could actually have higher accelerations. So this is important because engineered structures respond differently to different frequencies of earthquake engineering. So what we do is we look at the spectral accelerations at different frequencies, and that is important for your different dams or levees or components of gates and things like that. And so looking at the different spectral frequencies, these are all for magnitude seven earthquakes for a given reverse um, type of fault sources, and the uncertainties here represent the range in different GMPEs from different authors. So what we do is we, count, we, we compare the structure's design response spectrum that's designed for a given dam or levee or whatever to the response spectra that's generated from these, the range of these different spectral accelerations from um, the GMPEs. So I'll go into that at the last minute. We call that the uniform hazard response spectrum. 
I compare that to the structural design response spectrum. So how do we use those basic ground motions in deterministic seismic hazard analyses? The primary product is a um, MCE ground motion, or first the MCE, the maximum credible earthquake, which is a, a, a determined magnitude and location of the largest possible earthquake on a nearby seismic source. So we select that magnitude or that maximum credible earthquake based on what we know about the geology. And then we estimate the, or we calculate the source to site distance for that particular earthquake scenario. We select that scenario as the controlling one. So for John Day, for example, John Day Dam along the Columbia, we're gonna provide a, a deterministic seismic hazard response spectra for that and then for Bonneville. And I'll provide those on the right side real quick, but using this one a scenario, say for John Day Dam, we'll pick one scenario like this fault that runs real close to it, and we'll calculate the, and we'll estimate what the largest magnitude is from that range in magnitudes that's reasonably possible. And then we usually look at the 84th percentile of the ground motions, in other words, the one epsilon value for those ground motions from that particular source and then develop a response spectra from all of those different spectral accelerations and those GMPs. But so the PGA here is at the 0.1 second um, left side of this graph. The PGA for John Day deterministically from this fault would be at that value. But if we were to take Bonneville Dam down here, you wouldn't use the same fault because there's other faults that are nearby and they may actually produce um, larger ground motions. And in this case, this fault that's nearby, the Mount Hood fault, is closer to Bonneville Dam, and um, that would produce higher ground motions for Bonneville Dam deterministically than um, this Columbia Hills fault for is for John Day. So the deterministic MCE earthquake for Bonneville would be perhaps a magnitude 7 on this Mount Hood fault. And you can see the response spectra that would generate from that. So that's the that's the goal of the DSHA, is to um, provide uh, determinist ground motions that can be used for design input parameters. Of course, we already have these dams are built, so we're not going to design them. But we, if we needed to design um, some sort of other structure nearby, and then we also use the DSHA values to check the probabilistic results. Okay, so in summary, that's a quick summary of deterministic. Basically, we select a one or two or three scenarios of magnitude and distance and epsilon value. And then we, we typically choose that worst case earthquake, the MCE, and then we calculate the, the expected ground motions from that. And that's the deterministic um, number used for uh, design parameters and for checking PSHA. The PSHA, in contrast, we consider all those different scenarios and we compute the rate of every single one of those scenarios and then we accumulate all of them, add them all together, and that's the total hazard through time from a PSHA. So let me go through that. Just to, to break for a moment there, that's the PSHA component. And um, these include seismic hazard curves. We're going to talk about seismic hazard contributions from specific sources. I'll touch briefly on the response spectra and then on the ground motion time histories. So the overall calculating form for a PSHA um, includes a triple integral on magnitude, distance, or R, and then um, uncertainty in the ground motions, which is epsilon. So we accumulate all of those for, for each earthquake source, aerial and fault, and then we accumulate all of those for all of the sources. So we consider all possible earthquakes from that seismic source model, and then all of the different ground motions based on the uncertainties in the ground motion models. And we compute the rate for each of those earthquake ground motion scenarios. We sum them all up um, above some specified level, and then we can develop a seismic hazard curve and seismic res response spectra from those. So the key point here also is that it's not just all of the different probabilities, it's also that we can use that systematic bookkeeping accountability to have an explicit treatment of uncertainty in those ground motion models. So we're, we're getting better at this. The magnitude and the distance and the epsilon values allow us to constrain the uncertainties in the ground motions that are expected in any given site. 
So this next slide is kind of complex, but bear with me. Basically, it's just to show you the steps in a PSHA. We have the seismic source model that includes areas, aerial uh, fault sources and aerial sources. Just a couple of example pictures here. Those go into this area source characterization model where we have the frequency of occurrence versus magnitude. We use the ground motion model to calculate the peak ground acceleration and the seismic source to site distance. We do that same thing for all the different spectral amplitudes and source to site distances. Those are like those other curves that I showed earlier. And we put those together to develop these seismic hazard curves. So for PGA, the seismic hazard curve here ref reflects the annual exceedance probability or annual frequency of exceedance versus the ground motion amplitude, some measure of that, usually in G. And we do that for all of the, the PGA value and the spectral accelerations for different time per temporal periods. So 0.1 second, 0.2 second, one second, three seconds, five seconds. And we can generate hazard curves for each of those different spectral accelerations. We commonly just use PGA as shown over here on the right side. But we need to use this to develop the uniform hazard response spectrum, which is a way to estimate for any given probability um, the hazard at the different spectral accelerations. And that's what a uniform hazard response spectra is, as shown here. So those are the steps and those are the overall products from a PSHA. Let's go into just a, a couple of these real quick. The seismic hazard curve, as I, as I mentioned, represents the AEP on the left, and then in this case, linear, linear plotting of the peak ground acceleration. The mean curve drops off like this. We can also capture the 50th percentile and the 5th and 95th percentile based on that um, capture of the uncertainties in the calculations. And we can use that at different return periods to estimate both um, you know, design parameters like the OBE at 144 years, the MCE uh, ground motions at, say, the 84th percentile shows up as a vertical line because it doesn't have time in it. It's just a deterministic value. So we can compare that. And oftentimes, we hope the 84th percentile of the MCE is roughly equivalent to the 2475 year or uh, return period for the ground motions at the 84th percentile. Okay, so this is good. This is kind of consistent with what we would expect. If we need to consider risk at deeper frequencies, more remote um, probabilities, we can extend that curve. But as we extend that curve down to 10 to the minus fifth, we just don't have that many recordings of the super big earthquakes. So our uncertainties get really broad and sometimes incredibly broad that it's not even reasonable. So we have to play with that a little bit. But for risk assessments, these are the, the AEPs that we generally consider. The USGS has some tools that allows us to calculate those hazard curves pretty readily. And, and these are good tools. They're getting better. And they're, um, the updates in 2023 is going to make it even better. But for right now, the, the mean hazard curve, for instance, we can download the data from the USGS and develop a mean hazard curve for any given location in the, in the country. Um, basically, we can come up with the AEP values um, from the, the mean hazard uh, data. We can also calculate deeper frequency or deeper annual exceedance probabilities if we want to come up with 0.4 or 0.5 G. And you can do this at any given site, which is, uh, you know, we can go into the tool and develop that for periodic assessments or simple screening tools. What the USGS map has done is it does that on a grid basis throughout the country. It runs this mean hazard curve and it does it for every grid cell. I think it's a kilometer um, for the entire um, country. And then it can produce a map at any given annual exceedance probability. It can provide those ground motions. So that's what the national seismic hazard map is. It's using this particular hazard curve or a hazard curve like this given return period at every different location across the country. So I should note that these, these tools are really good for regional screening but and for periodic assessments, but they really should not be used for critical decisions or um, dam safety decisions or for engineering design.
you really need the more detailed site specific information and that's what in the core of the ER 1806 I'm sorry EM 1806 um, provides guidance on that if you need to look at it. Um, providing this uniform hazard response spectra, the USGS uh, tool also does that for you using that regional database. Again, that's good for screening and for some checks so that if your structure, for instance, has a fundamental period of one second and it's designed to accommodate something greater than, say, 0.5 spectral acceleration at that period, then you you perhaps might determine that you're okay. But if you're down in here, if your design parameter is below that for the 1% 50-year return period, you might want to consider doing seismic uh, site-specific PSHJ to figure that out. So without dwelling on this too much, the, the problem for um, complex structural analyses is that these um, use the full seismic source model and, you, and the source that drives these different um, uh, values on the UHRS might not be the ones that drive the total hazard at your particular site. For instance, um, in Cascadia, the megathrust earthquakes dominate these long period motions down in here, and the shallow crustal structures dominate these. But if you're only concerned about the ones down in here, then you might be able to get away with a, using a different value than the uniform hazard. And there's ways to do that that are more complex. Um, Lastly, the key point that I want to comment on are the uh, time histories. So we're getting close here. Um, in order to do a time history, you need to understand what the primary source of the hazard is. So we can use a, what we call a de-aggregation plot. This is an important concept in PSHA. It's the identification of hazard contributions from all the seismic sources in the PSHA. And a de-ag plot shows the distance and magnitude characteristics of all the specific sources. So you have a source to site distance on this axis, you have a magnitude on this axis, and then the height of these towers represents the, the percent of hazard that's contributed by each of those distance magnitude bins. The color of each of these different towers represents the epsilon value. So epsilon value of about one or zero, which is yellow, which is the mean, shows you that this is the mean hazard right here and it's driven by the Cascadia megathrust for this location, which happens to be the Army Corps office in downtown Portland. You can see from this um, that the crustal faults, which we know to be close and moderate magnitude, provide um, cumulative some significant hazard, but not the dominant hazard. And the deep interest lab also are significant contributors, but perhaps not the greatest. So when we're doing the um, the time histories that I'll get to in a sec, we definitely want to consider the Cascadia Megathrust interface zone as one of the key um, hazard contributors. So we want to be able to develop time histories that reflect the time histories from earthquakes on previous interface subduction zones. One other way to figure out uh, what your contributing hazards are is to look at a site-specific hazard curve, I mean source specific hazard curve, and this total hazard curve is shown here in black is the um, sum of all of these other individual source hazard curves. So this hazard curve, each of these source specific hazard curves shows just the hazard contributed from that particular source, um, faults and aerial sources, and the total hazard is a collection of all those. So the dominant contributor at high PGA at this particular site in Central California is this red background source zone. The significant contributors at low PGAs are um, the San Andreas and the Coast Ranges Sierra Boundary Block fault zone. So you, you might um, if you're concerned about this as your primary source, you're going to want to pick seed histories from uh, time histories from this dominant contributor. So what we want to know is not, not just the magnitude of earthquake um, energy that reaches the site, but also the duration of those strong ground motions. So in order to do that, we have to rely on the empirical database and we use um, previous recordings and we want to pick the previous recordings that are 
most consistent with the likely hazard that we're going to encounter at our site. So we need to understand the sources that control that hazard. And then we pick the ground motion time histories that will reflect that. This one in particular is, say, from the uh, Chi Chi earthquake in Taiwan, which is a reverse fault. And um, we pick, for instance, that ground motion time history that's needed for more detailed dynamic stability analyses. So we identify the reliable historical ground motion records that are comparable in source type magnitude, distance, and site conditions. And then we scale or match those time histories to, um, to the site uh, estimated magnitude and um, other characteristics ground motions from our particular site. So we match those, either scale it or spectrally match them, both the vertical ground motions and the horizontal ground motions. And then we use that in our more detailed, sophisticated analyses like um, FLAC or LS Dyna, as I explained later. So in summary, this is how the seismic hazard is used in an event tree, just as a reminder of where we are. We're gonna have that hazard curve be an input in here. And then for your seismic performance data, you're gonna to wanna to use those time histories and you in site-specific response spectra that are developed in more sophisticated ground motion um, PSHA. In summary, we, we provided an introduction of the hazard types and how we use that in risk assessments. We provided the basic components of seismic source models and ground motion models. Uh, the summary of the DSHA, and then the primary components of the probabilistic seismic hazard um, analyses.